Hello everybody, it's me the Boss Hog and today we're going to look at my stock portfolio as of the week ending the 26th of November, buy, sell, dividend and how the week went. Let's do it. Alright, so, I mean, normally I call out here like, you know, a few stocks that went down more than 4%, but basically you can assume almost my entire portfolio was down at uh, that kind of level, so for want of a better decision, uh, just assume that all of my portfolio vote is extremely red. Uh, some of them went down more than others. Obviously, my kind of uh, COVID related stocks uh, went down a lot. I'm sure everyone was fairly similar. Uh, notably for me, is WH Smith, which is a UK listed retailer. Uh, that was a big old drop on Friday. Uh, also, as well, I had a company that released results on Tuesday that the market uh, didn't react very nicely to. So that didn't help. Uh, and then also the FX was, uh, again, not particularly helpful this week. So it was uh, by far my worst week, uh, both as a percentage term and as an absolute value. Uh, and actually now over the last fortnight, my portfolio is down just over 7,000, uh, technically six, because I added like a thousand in capital, uh, but definitely the hardest uh, two weeks uh, that I've had since I've started uh, just under a year ago now. Uh, and yeah, across the last 10 days, um, you know, two of them have been black and several of them have been four figures uh, red. So that's been particularly unhelpful. Uh, it was quite an active week in terms of my uh, trading. Um, there were two reasons for that, that we'll get to in a second, but basically there was a Tuesday where I went hard on my uh, company that released not great results, but again, market didn't like them at all. Uh, and then Friday, uh, obviously the new variant, the uh, Omicron uh, COVID as it's now uh, called, uh, was there. Uh, and by the way, for anyone who's ever watched Futurama, I can't think of Omicron without thinking of, you know, the aliens from uh, Omicron, Percy I-8. So that's, I've now just got these images of, you know, like these greeny brown creatures uh, relating to COVID. So there's that as well for my uh, sins. Um, also as well, my capital added this week was uh, topped up just a little bit. I decided to do this on Friday um, for obvious reasons, I think, you know, the, the market went into pretty much free fall. Um, so what I did is I added my 400 as expected, and then I also used it as a chance to top up my wife's ISA. Uh, so now both of our ISAs are topped up for the year, which feels really great. Uh, there was only uh, 330 pounds left uh, in that to top it up. So I just decided to add that and uh, reassess from there. Uh, this weekend, I am planning on depositing some of my poker cash into my bank. So I may well top that up um, from that on Monday. Uh, we'll see though what the market looks like on Monday, but there may well be a, an additional capital injection next week uh, to pick, take some advantage of some stocks that I think have fallen a bit far. Uh, and then last but not least, my final dividend of the month. This is my second small one of the month, I would say, for Fever Tree. Uh, Fever Tree has actually been on a bit of a run recently. Uh, I sort of did a video a little while ago where I sort of said, you know, depending on the cases you look at, it could be anywhere between about 1800 and 2800 as a share price value. It's gone up to about 2700. Uh, fell back a little bit on Friday. I thought it'd actually fall back a little bit more. Uh, for me, I, I'm only really interested in buying Fever Tree under about 2300 at the moment, just because I think you need a little bit of uh, safety margin uh, in there. But, but anyway, it's nice to get a little uh, uh, dividend here from that. Uh, so yeah, uh, all right. Well, without further ado then, let's have a look at the buys and sells of this week. All right, so let's start with a big movement here, and this might surprise you, uh, but I actually bought this on Tuesday, so before Friday happened. Uh, if anyone watched the video last week, you'll note that I bought a medium-sized position into Genius Sports, which is a company I've traded before quite profitably. Um, and I, I decided to hold fire just to see what would happen on results day. I was super glad I did because, you know, following results day, the market just, uh, I mean, it went down like a third. Um, most of my buys here are, you know, well, you know, under $10, which brought my average price right down to $10.40, I believe, um, which I'm really happy at that kind of level. Uh, broadly speaking, the reason for the reaction was the fact that instead of making, you know, about 10 million EBITDA this year for the full year, uh, they, they kind of got zero to 5 million, but then they added the wording that, you know, it's going to be broadly break even. So it's going to be right on the lower side of that. So in fairness, it is basically them saying that their earnings are going to be 10 million lower for the year than expected. Uh, but in saying that, you know, part of the reason for that was revenue outperformance, picking up uh, new customers. Um, and to be honest with you, I, like, I get it, right? Earnings are going to take a little while longer to come through. Um, but I'd rather that they took advantage of what seems like a lot of growth areas at the moment. So, you know, they, they took some time to explain uh, their opportunity to maybe address the non uh, sports market, but, you know, like companies who advertise in sports venues. So, you know, they were basically looking at creating a new uh, earning stream in the long run from that, which again, I was quite excited about, totally get where they were coming from on that. Um, and yeah, for me, this was a chance to basically have a bit of a gamble. I mean, before Friday, that was going to be my main focus this week, right? Basically a bit of a gamble with this. This is um, 
altogether now they're about 10% of my portfolio in Genie, which considering this is not quite yet a profitable company, it's kind of hovering around that level. Um, it's quite a big decision for me because normally I don't really invest in early stage companies so much, but I just really like the direction. Again, I, I, I'm a bit of a poker player. I work with data. Uh, I kind of get where the business is coming from, from a, you know, gambling, content, data perspective. It, it makes a lot of sense to me. And, um, you know, as far as I can tell there, uh, the board seems very professional other than maybe the CCO was a bit wordy. Um, but, you know, it seems very good. Like if I compare this to GAN, which is often kind of seen on par, it, this is just such a better company, basically, like better run, a better revenue stream already. I think it's kicking in much better, basically. It seems more professional. I just like it a lot more. Uh, so yeah, decided to get back into Genius in, in a heavy in a heavy way, and I think in the medium term this is going to come really good. Uh, I also continue to buy Gamma quite heavily. Uh, I just think Gamma is really materially undervalued. I obviously wish I'd held off until Friday, but it was a bit weird because like on Friday Gamma, along with basically everything, went down. But if anything, I would say that Gamma should benefit from any further lockdown, right? This is a company that does uh, working from home, remote working, fixed mobile convergence, really super well. Uh, so I don't really get why it fell on Friday. I did pick up some more shares on Friday, you know, like 17. But to me, anything under 18 here is a really easy buy. And I actually have a 24 uh, pound uh, target price. So, you know, uh, which I will say is on kind of like the medium to upper quartile of analyst estimates. But, you know, I think I know the industry very well and I've worked with Gamma in the past. Uh, so for me, it's a, a very easy decision. And again, in a way, I would argue that if there is further lockdown, Gamma will be one of the winners. Uh, in their own numbers, they called out the fact that, you know, COVID actually sped up some of the work that they were doing, uh, including things, you know, like mobile into Teams, Microsoft Teams integration and things like that, which again, isn't, isn't the easiest thing to do um, as one of their products now. So all those kind of things made me want to just buy some more. Um, I've decided to group Hollywood Bowl and National Express uh, because although I get why they're kind of on the periphery as COVID stocks, uh, they don't have any like transnational um, stuff, right? Like Bowl especially is only UK. Uh, so obviously if there's a UK lockdown, Hollywood Bowl will be impacted. But when their stores are open, uh, they throw off money. Uh, and to me, I think here this is comfortably a good risk reward play. Uh, they published their numbers for the last trading year in December. I'm expecting, uh, you know, more or less break even, something like that, judging from their earlier trading update in September. Uh, probably a small loss, something like 10 million loss, something like that, which, you know, for a 400 million market cap is fine. Um, so, yeah, so I, I continue to buy Hollywood Bowl. I think anything under 230 is a very easy buy for me personally. I think that's about 20% undervalued uh, just based on previous earnings and, uh, and that trading update. Uh, and National Express, although they have like, you know, businesses in Germany, Spain, America, etc. Um, they don't do any like cross border stuff. And again, I think the, uh, the market is overly seeing them as a COVID stock. So I've just decided to top up my shares in National Express. I only bought another 165, but that actually rounds off my total holding to 10,000 shares. Uh, so significant holding in this now, like 22,000, right? And considering my portfolio is currently... Um, you know, 96,000, it's, it's about 23% of my portfolio, something like that. So a very large uh, play in National Express. Uh, and then I decided to group these two as well, because although I think they're riskier, uh, I think there's enough risk reward to justify it. So I'll start actually with WH Smith, who had uh, a dreadful fall on Friday. I think um, I personally uh, would mark off about 10% off of WH Smith uh, if the uh, Omicron variant does turn out to be as bad as feared. Uh, the main reason for that is they earn about two thirds of their earnings from travel. Uh, so, you know, their stores in airports and railways. Uh, so, you know, like if that was longer delayed before it returns to profitability, that would be a concern for me. I think it's completely justified that it fell like 13 percent, was it, on Friday? Um, for me, however, though, you know, like they do have profit profitable arms in UK High Street, in US High Street now is also turned profitable. Uh, their, their card um, company as well, Funky Pigeon, uh, is also profitable. Uh, it's just the fact that because their travel business isn't yet profitable, it's kind of dragged everything down. Uh, but, you know, they were saying themselves that it's going in the right way. And I think it's an, a, a good play if it does have some risk, obviously, of the worst uh, realizations from this variant come true and we have to enter more, you know, uh, global lockdowns basically. Um, with Everaz, so this is a company that I really like. It's my iron ore play. I made a video before, I think it's my most watched um, regarding Everaz compared to Rio Tinto. And I know everyone views Rio as like a generalist miner. It's really not, it's an iron ore play. Um, so I might as well go with, you know, a, a more of a specialist. 
Uh, Everise also has about a fifth of its business in coking coal, which kind of um, has been moving different directions to iron ore. Uh, but actually, iron ore seems to have found its floor. It went up to like $100 per tonne. Uh, and Everise at those kind of levels, I expect to be profitable. Uh, and, you know, for me, it was under 575 um, for the shares. And I decided that I'd quite like to get back into Everise. Uh, it's a huge yield, they're assuming that the yield isn't cut with the reduction in iron ore price. Uh, but it's just a very much specialist kind of end-to-end -end play. It has mills, it does the steel output as well, and again, it has coking coal to reduce the input, input costs, whereas other iron ore uh, manufacturers don't have that, so they would have seen their margins reduced as coking coal's gone up in price, right? Whereas uh, Everaz would be much less prone to that. Uh, and also the other thing with Everaz, why I, compare, why I prefer to uh, against Rio, for example, is that Rio's mines for iron ore all in Australia. Well, a lot of the output for that is going to China, which has got a bit of a trade dispute with Australia. So it's trying to buy its iron ore from everywhere else. Now, I know eventually it's like a global market. So, you know, the Aussies can just get rid of it somewhere else. But ultimately, Everaz is the winner from that if China can just get it from Russian mines instead. Right. So I think kind of geopolitically, uh, although there's some risk having a Russian owned uh, company, uh, I, I like it. So, you know, I think the share price has been less volatile compared to things like Vale, especially, and Rio Tinto. Uh, but I think there are some good reasons for that. But so, yeah, so I, I decided 575 and under was enough for me to get stuck back in. And so I did just that, basically. So uh, I, I'll look to build my stake in Everaz. Uh, anything under 575, I'll just put more money into it, basically, is my plan. Uh, okay, so yeah, uh, anything else I haven't talked about here, feel free to ask. Those are the call outs that I wanted to uh, mention. Uh, and otherwise, let's have a look at what I've sold this week. All right, so I decided to sell out of my best performing stock um, completely. It'd been Huntsman Corporation. I made many thousands off of this. I think about 4,000 in total profit. Uh, really great. I sort of timed it before the activist investor got involved. Um, I did attend their last earnings call and felt like you could comfortably add from my initial aim of $32 a share and make it more like 35. Uh, I was selling out anywhere between 32 and 34 here, uh, just because I think most of the um, upside is already factored in. Now, the activist investor is due to publish something in the next couple of weeks, but I just don't really see um, enough potential further upside. So, you know, with like other things felt like they're on offer, uh, I decided to sell Huntsman, which, which wasn't originally what I planned. Uh, but again, I wanted to free up some money for Genie uh, buying that under ten dollars seemed just a, a lot of upside, I think. Um, so yeah, a bit sad to see Huntsman go because I think it's still a really great company. I was kind of keeping an eye on it on Friday just to see if it also had a big overreaction. But you know, I think with the activist investor, there seems to have created a bit of a flaw there, uh, so it didn't really fall back as much as you might have uh, hoped. Uh, so yeah, I I'll keep an eye on Huntsman. Uh, you know, anything under probably about thirty dollars will get me interested again. Uh, because I do think it's moving in the right direction. Uh, but for now, I've decided just to let it go and I'll keep a, an eye on it from a distance. <clears throat> uh, so I also decided to sell Lockheed. Again, this was on Friday uh, just to try and take advantage of uh, some opportunities. Uh, so originally I had like two shares in LMT uh, and then I bought another six following the big earnings drop. So I was actually up about 5% when I sold it on a Friday. It was one of the few things that was holding up. So arguably a good defensive stock for things like this. But again, there was so much red in my portfolio and, and to me like uh, an overreaction basically. Uh, you know, if I had any more cash, I would have put it into it. But I'm pretty maxed out on my cash and also uh, LMT is in my ice that was already full. Uh, so I just didn't really have uh, too much more I could do um with it so i decided to sell uh, you know two grand out of lmt meant i could buy some uh, some epd some evras um some i can't remember what else i bought you know so but it was just like trying to uh, to buy some more oh yeah so phoenix as well one of my favorite insurers um and uh, and we went from there so i decided to sell them again i probably will buy into lockheed martin but the other thing worth saying as well like when i was buying this you know like three to eight three thirty i thought it was a real bargain and then I kind of watched some videos, did some more research, and I was like, you know, buying it for 330 isn't isn't bad. Like, I think it's a perfectly good place to buy the shares. But it wasn't like the massive upside that I originally got really excited about. So I was like, you know what, like, it's at like 345 or whatever it was I sold it for. I'm going to just, uh, I'm going to use this money elsewhere. So that, that was part of my decision there as well on, on Friday. Uh, similarly on Friday, uh, I should, probably shouldn't do this, but I, you know, in my last month end video, I was like, oh, I need to buy some house builders in the UK, right? So I picked these two uh, for reasons I've explained before, uh, and then I decided to sell because again, like they were up five percent in a month, so great on very small holdings, right? I didn't have enough chance to build anything into these just yet, uh, but I really wanted some money to buy other things, so that's 
I, ju I was just desperately looking for money to uh, buy the dip on Friday. So that was the decision there. And actually similar with HBAN as well. So uh, this is a bank that I was into originally uh, super keen on them fairly early when, you know, at one stage I was buying shares on like the $13. Uh, and for me, I think the $17 target here is perfectly reasonable. Um, so I had one share just to keep an eye on it, but I'd even decided to sell that as well, just to, um, again, try and find any money I could. Uh, but I do quite like uh, HBAN. I think under $15 especially would be a very clear buy for me. Uh, obviously, if the interest rates are going to take longer to recover, then it's going to be less of a winner. But, you know, like if you look at it's like digital uh, channels, I think they're really good. I think the branding's great. They they are now basically fully digested their large uh, acquisition. And they're more or less smack bang in the middle of the S&P 500 in terms of market cap. So, you know, I think now they've become... Uh, at least a medium sized player by American bank standards. But it's one of those kind of interesting ones, I think, for kind of like regional diversification for me was good. Um, and uh, and yeah, kind of growth in the future. And by the way, it yields really well. Last I looked, it was like four and a bit percent. So uh, there's that of that as well. I mean, especially by American standards, that's a huge yield. Uh, so again, I would absolutely consider rebuying into HBAN. Uh, it is on my watch list and I'll consider it under $15. Uh, but for now, it was uh, <laughs> just one share. That I, again, I was just freeing up money from wherever I possibly could. So that was the uh, that was the thinking there. Uh, so anyway, uh, obviously, I'm trying to navigate the current situation uh, as well as I can. In hindsight, I probably wouldn't have gone so heavy, heavy into Genie on Tuesday if I knew, you know, that stuff was going to happen on Friday because uh, I think there were some good uh, buying opportunities. But saying that, I'm also not particularly sad that I have a good uh, chunk now in Genie, because I think that will come good in the medium to long term. Um, and, you know, I'm relatively happy uh, trying to navigate, uh, again, a difficult couple of weeks. So uh, obviously there's still two more months of this, uh, sorry, two more days of this month remaining. So I'll do a month end video uh, sometime next week, uh, and then we'll get to see how it looks for the whole month. Uh, currently, though, I'm down on the month about 4,000. I had been up 3,000, right? So there's that seven, six, seven grand swing over the last couple of weeks. Uh, and again, we just try and navigate this uh, as well as we can. So uh, overall for the year, I'm still up uh, significantly. Uh, so again, that's another thing I've been doing just to try and keep myself mentally stable. Uh, it's just to remind myself, you know, that I was up massively. Okay, now I'm up slightly less massively. Uh, but in terms of percentage, you know, I'm still up way ahead of where I, my long term aspiration is in terms of my uh, my stock uh, compounding rate of growth. Uh, so, you know, that that's kind of something that I think is important. Like I, I do similar for data, right? You collect data so that when you have a rough period, uh, you just look back on your data and you remind yourself, like, actually, it's really not that bad if you take this long term view. So I think that's important for anyone who had a difficult week. I suspect most of us had a difficult Friday at least. Uh, but, you know, in general, I think that can be very helpful if, uh, if you know, you're feeling a bit beaten up, which is probably how I've been feeling the last couple of weeks. Uh, but again, no, nothing too bad. I'm not panic selling, I don't think. Um, and, you know, I'm trying to buy and respond as well as I can. So what more can you do from that? Uh, so, yeah, hopefully that was an honest uh, insight, a useful video. Uh, like, comment, subscribe, and all that other good stuff uh, and questions below. Otherwise, I've been the Boss Hog. Thanks very much for watching, everyone, and good luck with your investing. Bye for now.